Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and good morning to my viewers in New Zealand. You should be just waking up at the time that I'm releasing this piece of content. Welcome to the Angry Astronaut. Once again, it's time to talk about perhaps what's becoming my favorite spaceflight company out there, and that is Rocket Lab. Now, although nobody seems to talk a lot about this distinction, but Rocket Lab is actually the only private company that is currently planning missions to two separate planets on their own. That is, this is not a mission where they're transporting a NASA probe on behalf of them or anything along those lines. This is where Rocket Lab is actually designing their own spacecraft, utilizing their own rockets, pretty much utilizing their own technology for the entire mission. And this, of course, is their mission to Venus, where they're going to be looking for life in the upper atmosphere of that planet, where the pressures and temperatures are not that dissimilar to Earth, and then, of course, Mars. And this was the result of a NASA request to try to take care of this nagging problem of sample retrieval. You see, NASA is on the verge at this very moment of canceling the most important Mars mission that they have ever planned. And as strange as and impossible as that may sound, it's true. The Perseverance rover was sent to Mars specifically with the intention of looking for past life, but it didn't have all the instruments on board to get the job done on its own. It didn't have, for example, the scanning electron microscopes and the other types of chemical testing equipment that are available to laboratories that are just very difficult to transport to other planets. And so, therefore, it became necessary for Perseverance to gather samples from a variety of different promising locations to deposit those samples with the intention of a later mission retrieving them. But as time went on, the mission became more and more expensive, even with the European Space Agency handling a significant portion of it, still was looking at over $10 billion to get this job done. And this, of course, is beyond NASA's capabilities, especially given the fact that Artemis is, and SLS especially is sucking up so much of the budget. So NASA was looking at canceling the most important important part of Perseverance's mission, the whole idea of finally determining if there is life on the surface of the red planet. Even though I've released many, many videos arguing that there is definitely life there, that I think we have more than enough evidence to suggest that there has to be something alive in the Martian regolith, we really don't know what that life is is. Is it single-celled? Is it a multicellular organism of some kind? A simple multicellular organism only visible through a microscope? Is it perhaps just a virus? Hard to say until we can actually examine the sample. But as I said, looks like that this whole plan is going to be canceled soon, and it's going to be left to China, who have their own sample return mission to Mars planned out. And they've proven to be pretty damn good at doing these sample return missions, given what they've been able to do on the moon lately. So that being the case... It may be China. In fact, it will definitely be China who determines decisively, definitively, not only if there's life on Mars, but what kind of form that life might take. But guess what? NASA put out a request, an RFP to a variety of private companies to see if somebody else could come up with a better plan. SpaceX, of course, has presented a plan that involves Starship. The problem with Starship, of course, is that to get a Starship all the way to Mars, that requires a hell of a lot of low Earth orbit refueling. 10 missions minimum, so that means we're looking at 11 total launches minimum in order to get all of that done. That's complicated, that's difficult, and also potentially quite expensive because you have to design the spacecraft and figure out a way of getting the spacecraft back. It obviously can't be Starship that comes back because that would involve so much in-situ mining on Mars, refueling Starship, etc. 
it would just add a lot more expense and complexity to the mission. So not necessarily the best solution, but Rocket Lab, on the other hand, come out with a solution that requires only three total launches. They take care of the entire mission, including the retrieval, including the lander, including an orbiter, which communicates with the lander, and also the return mission that originally was supposed to be handled by the European Space Agency. And they are coming in less than half of what NASA was originally planning for this mission, substantially less than half. So currently, the Rocket Lab proposal is coming in at a little under $4 billion, or less than 40% of what NASA was looking at paying for the same type of mission. It still sounds like a lot of money, but there's a reason for that. Number one, it requires three expendable launches of Neutron. This is a personal opinion, by the way. Rocket Lab hasn't actually stated that, but Neutron, without being expendable, can't really lift a whole lot of mass beyond low Earth orbit. We're talking 2.8 metric tons, assuming that it's in expendable mode for a geosynchronous transfer orbit launch. Without that, if you try to reuse the first stage, you're not going to get enough mass in order to carry a significantly heavy payload out to Mars. So again, I'm thinking that this is going to be three expendable launches of Neutron. Still not a ridiculous expensive solution, especially when you consider that Boeing's proposed solution right now is to use an SLS and a significantly heavier lander that can get the whole job done in one shot, but SLS costs $4 billion just to launch the rocket to say nothing of the rest of the mission. So this is definitely going to be less expensive. Let's have a look at the components. First of all, you have the Mars Telecommunications Orbit this being necessary to communicate, obviously, with the surface and everything going on there, and then relay those instructions back to mission control. Then you have the Earth Return Orbiter, and this will collect the samples that have been gathered by the Mars Lander and Retrieval Vehicle on the surface, and this transfer will happen in orbit. So the Lander and Retrieval Vehicle will obviously set down on the surface of Mars, whereupon the samples will be transferred into the retrieval vehicle and then the samples will be carried up to the Earth Return Orbiter via an ascent vehicle that is part of the Mars Lander and Retrieval Vehicle. Also, there's an entry and descent system that's part of the Mars Lander and Retrieval Vehicle that includes a heat shield that will protect the vehicle as it enters the Mars atmosphere and also parachutes to carry it safely down to the surface. And then finally, the Earth Entry System, which is part of the Earth Return Orbiter. When this whole mission finally gets back to Earth, this tiny little heat shield and whatever is contained within will bring the samples back to Earth for analysis. Okay, so let's watch the mission in action. As I said, we have three dedicated launches of Neutron. Again, perhaps there might be some reusability involved here depending on the mass of each vehicle, but let's just assume each one is expendable. First of all, you have a mission that launches the Mars Telecommunications Orbiter, a second mission that launches the Earth Return Orbiter, and finally, the Mars Lander and Retrieval Vehicle. Now, the Mars Telecommunications Orbiter launches first to provide support for the arrival of the Earth Return Orbiter and entry of the Sample Return Lander at Mars. The MTO will also serve as an upgraded telecommunications relay asset for the MSR surface operations and future missions. Number two will be the retrieval vehicle and number three, the actual lander. So let's go ahead and follow the lander through its journey. Now, one thing that Rocket Lab is quick to point out is this is not their first encounter with the Red Planet. The very rover that's currently on Mars that has collected the samples for this return mission carries Rocket Lab technology. Their solar panels provided power for the Perseverance rover's cruise stage spacecraft and again on the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. So this is something they've done before. And also, if you want to talk about heat shields and re-entry, 
country well rocket lab is one of the few companies that has done this as well and this was for the varda mission that ended up circling the earth for weeks while somebody gave them permission to actually land not the faa but australia in the end but the rocket lab technology and heat shield safely brought the varda samples back to earth and there's every reason to believe that rocket lab technology could carry out this type of mission as well so the retrieval vehicle sets down on the surface of mars and at this point it's going to be up to perseverance to transfer some of these samples into the lander now this is a part of the mission that NASA might not like very much. Many of the other sample return scenarios have included the retrieval vehicle trundling around to collect the sample vials that Perseverance has already deposited on the surface of the red planet. So Perseverance may have to keep whatever sample vials it has left and it only has 15 usable vials remaining at this point. It may just have to keep those in reserve rather than having to go back, retrace its steps, and get these vials again. And then, as you can see, an ascent stage heads up to orbit, carrying the samples with it. And Rocket Lab has a lot of experience with small-scale propulsion systems, so they say that they'll be able to carry out this part of the mission as well. And then there's going to be the docking in Mars orbit, something that has never been accomplished before. Orbital docking is a tough thing to do in low earth orbit let alone tens of millions of kilometers away but once again rocket lab has the experience of enabling this type of docking with the u.s space force victus Hayes mission and also the astroscale missions both of which involve this type of docking as well but again that's earth orbit not mars orbit and again boeing is saying that all of this is unnecessary that sls can get the job done with a single launch, a great big heavy lander that will have a powerful enough ascent stage to carry the samples all the way back to Earth, no multiple launches, no Mars orbital docking, none of that required, but at the same time, insanely expensive. So as you can see, a re-entry being done very much in the same way as the Varda samples were returned to Earth, so not a huge difference there either, and Rocket Lab definitely has has the technological capability to carry this mission out and so far they have the lowest price as well at least if we're talking about a great combination of low cost and a lot more simplicity than the SpaceX 11 launch mission. And incidentally, Rocket Lab is requesting that NASA also take quotes from European launch providers who have already been talking about providing the return mission segment of this entire setup. If Europe were to handle that part of it, then the price would drop even further, perhaps to 30% or 25% of what NASA was originally intending, and that could make this mission quite doable but here's the question even if this sample comes back loaded with bacteria is that going to be enough to satisfy the scientific community so all of this is very exciting, but there is one potential problem that continues to nag at me, continues to gnaw away at my consciousness a bit, and that is the fact that even with this sample retrieval, might not be enough. This might not be enough to convince the scientific community that there is life on Mars, because even if a sample is returned that's actually absolutely swarming with bacteria, how can you 100% prove that that bacteria was not brought over by the lander in the first place, that there wasn't contamination? In spite of all the effort that you might make to make sure that the probe and, its, and everything it carries is sterile, a lot of times, there's no way to be 100% certain of that. And so without that 100% certainty, without extraordinary evidence to support this extraordinary claim, the scientific majority may still not be convinced in spite of all of it. It still may not be definitive. In my opinion, the scientific majority will not be convinced that there's life on Mars until an 
an astronaut visiting Mars actually contracts a horrible Martian disease. In my opinion, they're just not going to believe it until something that radical actually happens. It's truly unfortunate, but I just think that the current scientific majority, the scientific community, has just become so incredibly conservative in their thinking so concerned that they might be wrong about such an extraordinary conclusion that they are afraid to ever come to this extraordinary conclusion, regardless of how much evidence might exist. And that, sadly, is quite unfortunate indeed. Thanks very much for watching. Hey, take a look at the new merch in case you haven't seen it yet. Check it out. I have been, we have reopened the store. Look at these. Look at the quality of this stuff. Just beautiful shirt. Look at that. Oh yeah, look at that. You know what? Unlike Teespring, unlike these other sorry companies, these, these logos don't wash out. Look at this. If you're into asteroids, if you're into asteroids, check this out, baby. In 2029, Kiss your asteroids. Goodbye. And if it's something you'd like to order, all the details are in the description and also pinned in the comments. Thanks again for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, stay angry about space.